bioeconomy. Inefficient microbial strains, a lack of skilled labour, a lack of funding, a lack of fit for purpose capacity. I'm here at the SynBioBetter conference in San Jose with Mark Warner from Liberation Labs to get his take. I mean, the current network out there today is a legacy network. It averages 40 to 50 years old, and it was built for other purposes, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, biofuels, and it can make the products that the, these new technologies want to make, but it's not making them at the scale or cost structure that's needed. And really, the other item is it's not where you'd build these facilities today. It's often in Europe. Power prices and other reasons make it less economical. Okay, so you're currently building out your first commercial scale precision fermentation facility in Richmond, Indiana. Tell me a bit about, you know, what capacity will it have and what kind of equipment are you installing to make it more fit for purpose? Sure. A uh, facility is 600,000 liters. It can be run in two 300,000 liter halves or a whole facility. It's going to depend on the process we host. Most of them we've looked at somewhere between 600 to maybe 1,500 metric tons a year of purified protein. So that's, that gives you a, a basic example of, of kind of the size and scale. As far as the process itself, very modern, designed for both foods and non foods. It's got high oxygen transfer, aseptic aerobic fermentation, very modern sterile design can run very long fermentations. Downstream recovery is um, designed specifically for very high yield recovery. It's multi-stage ceramic microfiltration, multi-stage spiral wound ultrafiltration, evaporation and agglomeration spray drying. I mean, honestly, in this environment, just to be able to go from sugar to final dried product on the same site, very few facilities yeah. can do that today, especially not in the U.S. I think you said in the past as well that you can also run a broader range of organisms than the majority of kind of contract manufacturers out there? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Best example would be mm -hmm. methanol-fed Pichia pastoris. Most common grass-approved organism in the U.S. today, very few of these legacy facilities can run it. It's very hard to retrofit an old facility to accept methanol. So because of it, very few can run it, and the ones that can, usually it's only a couple of their fermenters. In our case, it was a design case for for Richmond, so it can run 100% on methanol-fed Pichia. It can run on E. coli instead. It can run on Saccharomyces. When we look at the range of organisms out there, we're confident we can host uh, pretty much the majority of them from zero to 100%. I mean, so far we've been able to raise um, 36 million of equity. We've got a 30 million dollar um, uh, equipment financing mechanism and a 25 million dollar USDA loan guarantee. Facility itself costs 115 million. So when you do all that math, it's over two thirds of the cost of the facility that we've raised already. We're in late stage of a fundraise now. We've had an external lead since the end of last year, and we're expecting to close around in the 75 million dollar range by middle of this year. Okay, and, and in terms of the interest you've had, what kinds of companies yeah. do you anticipate will be using this facility and do you have kind of firm agreements yeah. uh, from them? A pretty good bench of LOIs with multiple companies, again, in the food and non-food space that gives us confidence by the time the facility comes on early next year, we'll have ample backlog under contract. So there's been a lot of discussion during this conference about um, the unit economics of precision fermentation, mm -hmm. you know, where it makes sense, where it doesn't. Um, is there a kind of sweet spot, you know, for especially in the food and ag area, you know, um, is that particularly challenging when you've got maybe, does it only really make sense for, you know, high priced mm -hmm. ingredients used in small quantities? You know, it, it depends. It goes all mm -hmm. through the range. The food products, especially the more commodities, the ways and things, are more challenged. Yeah. They definitely need probably the bigger facility we have planned to really get cost parity. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of belief and a lot of the discussions we have are as much, they'll manufacture at these higher intermediate prices if they're confident they can get closer to parity long term. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other products, materials, infant formula components, yeah. agricultural biologics, mm -hmm that are very profitable both for us and for the end user today. So it, mm -hmm. it follows through on that whole range. I think as we get these products closer to market and can show the profitability, we're, we're absolutely convinced in the conversations we've had that once we start hitting traditional return mechanisms, there's plenty of money there. It's getting those binding offtakes and the draw and the cost of the products where, you know, and you've heard others say this at the conference, acknowledging that everybody along that chain needs to make some margin. What are your view at some of the biggest things kind of holding back the bioeconomy? We've talked about, you know, capacity fit for purpose, but, but what else? Is it about 
inefficient microbial strains, lack of skilled labour, um, the need for more continuous, you know, efficient processes. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the other levers that need to be pulled, if you like? You know, I, I think to some degree it's all of them. I still think the the biggest obstacle is committed demand. You know, people talk about the funding issues, and a lot of the funding is because there's not a traditional bankable demand on the yes. other side. So I certainly think there's part of that. You know, I we've been we've been impressed by the strain improvements we've seen over the last couple of years, especially as we talk to more both with the startups and as we talk to these large um, CPG type companies that have internal processes, you don't see them out, you know, publicizing themselves as much, but they've been making very solid progress with strains that we also think have a likelihood of becoming commercially viable. What about continuous versus batch processes? What I would say is we like to focus on productivity. Um, a batch fermentation that gives me a high titer in one sure. day could be better than a week-long continuous. Yeah. Now, continuous, I think, as a theme, yes. certainly has interest. It's been used in pharmaceuticals for years. It's not as common in the type of fermentation we do. From our perspective as a manufacturer, if you run continuous fermentation, what you really need is a robust sterile design. We believe being more modern than the other facilities, if if continuous fermentation gets to that stage, we'll be set up to run it. But fed batch and drawn fill are our base case, which are about halfway to two thirds of the way to continuous fermentation. What would you like to see from the government to support this industry? You know, um, first, we want to thank USDA. Um, they've been very supportive with the $25 million loan guarantee. That's been very helpful. You know, beyond that, we see a lot of good efforts, both in the U.S. and externally, but especially in the U.S. You know, I'll say there's a lot of possibilities, but there's four, five, six, seven different programs, be it loan guarantees or the National Security Initiative or others, Biomade, all are good initiatives. We'd like to see them kind of morph a little more because it, it seems like they're almost independent routes now, but we do see that interest and that draw. And the other thing I'd add is we'd also like to see, and you've seen this some with the recent DOD initiatives, is it doesn't just have to be a financial push. The government, again, being a counterparty and buying some of these products can also be what helps them commercialize.